Hello, friends, and welcome back to Malicious Compliance Stories. I think one of the worst parts of this story is that the owner thinks it's okay to grab his employees. Even if our OP had been an employee and were ignoring him, he would have had no right to put his hands on her. But before we begin, the best way to support our channel is to leave comments, like, and subscribe with the turned on bell so you don't miss the new video every single day. Gas station owner thinks I work for him. This happened to me in a gas station once. I was 17, so legally could not have worked there because they sold alcohol. When I was a teenager, everyone said I looked quite a bit older. The owner of the gas station mistook me for one older lady who worked there. I didn't realize it at the time, but this lady looked exactly like me, just older. I'm in getting a Red Bull, and I hear, have you clocked in yet? I didn't think he was talking to me, so I kept on looking. Suddenly, this 50-plus-year-old man is standing right in front of me, like stranger danger close. I was in college at the time, but still I was 17. I backed off and put my hands up in front of me. What are you doing? He almost screams at me. Get in the back. I don't pay you to drink our goods on the clock and put on your work shirt. We have a dress code. I was terrified. I'd never been in a position like this before. I stammered something like, I think you're mistaking me for someone else. But with my adrenaline pounding in my ears, I couldn't even be sure that's what I said. I turned and started walking quickly towards the door, almost in tears, because that's what anxiety does, and about to steal the Red Bull I forgot was still in my hand when I get a yank on my shoulder. Come back here. Something kicked in. I remember the Red Bull. I threw it right at his face. It was the big 20-ounce can. Dude let go and ducked. I made it outside and stood by my car watching the door. This was before I had a cell phone, so I didn't know what to do. My parents lived over an hour away. Two things happened then. The owner came out of the store, and a cop pulled up and parked. He must have been on a munchy run himself. The store owner had apparently realized his mistake because the lady he mistook me for had called out sick, but he hadn't gotten the message yet. When he saw the cop outside, he assumed I'd called them and started apologizing all over the place. I wasn't sure what to do but I felt like I should at least make the owner show the cop the security tape. He kept downplaying it and claiming, oh, you can barely see anything at that angle. After reviewing the tape, the cop called my parents and we pressed assault charges. The owner faced prison for four months because I was a minor. Had this incident happened to me now as an adult, I would have reacted differently. I would have spoken up for myself instead of trying to just leave. Almost 40 years is a lot of time to gain knowledge and experience to handle situations that are tense and dangerous. Unfortunately, at 17, I was not equipped with this knowledge or experience. This was a small college town. I'd been in school away from home for only about a month at this point. Some of you may call that sheltered and wimpy, and I'll admit, sure, maybe I was at that point, and maybe I was about to leave with something I hadn't paid for. I was panicking. I never said I was in the right. The ultimate point is, an adult man touched and manipulated the body of a minor girl without consent. And yes, it was super convenient that a cop was right there. Like I said, small college town. If he hadn't been there, I don't know how this would have ended. Whether it was because of what happened with me or not, I hope he learned something from his experience and maybe changed his behavior towards others. And our second story. People will do anything for a taste of the high life. I work in the events industry, the majority of which revolves around organizing and managing corporate events. You know the deal, sales meetings, product launches, all that jazz. I will say that in my experience, most of the guests are absolutely lovely. They're normally very excited to have been invited and on their absolute best behavior until the open bar. Then the dance floor looks like a year six disco and the bathrooms are a no-go zone. That's off topic, but the point is that it's only occasionally that you get a raging D-bag. Surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, it's always the people who don't really have any power but want to pretend they do to the little people who are working the event. Basically, we're scum and should do what they say because they're regional manager of blah blah blah. On this particular occasion, I was drafted into helping load the auditorium for the main session. It was a massive room, but there were over 4,000 people attending the event, so it was crucial that we fill up all the seats so that everyone got one. Now, human nature dictates that most people will try and leave a gap between them and the stranger next to them, so we packed the room with organizers to politely pressure people to squeeze up and get cozy. There was also tiered seating at the back, which we blocked off so that people would have to fill the room from the front and the load would be easier. I don't know if you know this, but people love tiered seating. 
they go crazy for an elevated view of the stage, which I get, so I was put on one of the tiered seats walkways to stop people going up. Most people looked a bit put out when I turned them away but accepted my explanation, heading off to get a seat nearer the front. One man, however, didn't accept it so easily. This is the conversation we had. Not verbatim, but pretty close. Me. Sorry, sir, we've got a pretty packed room this morning, so we're loading people from the front. We're unfortunately not opening the tiered seats until all the floor-level seats have been filled. Him. I want to sit up there. I always sit at the back. Me. I completely understand, sir, but unfortunately, I can't let you through right now. If I let you through, other people will want to come up, too. Him, showing me his badge. I'm a dealer for host company's name. All my customers are here. I don't want to have to sit with them. Isn't there an area for the dealers? I looked at his badge, and it did say Dealer John Johnson. I don't remember the actual name. Unfortunately, that meant absolutely nothing in the current situation, so the conversation had to continue. Me. I'm sorry, I don't think there's any categorized seating apart from for the press and the speakers. Him. That's ridiculous. You expect me to sit with my customers? No, I want to sit up there. Let me through. It shouldn't be an issue. I remember thinking it was a little weird that he'd said the thing about sitting with his customers twice now, especially so loudly in a room full of co-workers and, I assume, his customers? I also noticed that several of the other people blocking the walkways up to the tiered seating have actually let a couple of people through, but this man is obviously an entitled jerk, and there was no way I was going to let him win this one. Me. Sir, I apologize for the inconvenience that this is causing you, but I cannot let you through to this seating. It's not been opened yet, and it's my job to stop people from going up there. Even if you think it's ridiculous, I take my job seriously. I'm afraid I'll need you to take a seat in the floor seating along with everyone else. Him. Oh yeah? And what are you going to do? How are you going to make me? Now, this man was probably 5 foot 8 tops, no shame in that, but while I'm a girl, I'm also 6 feet. I look down at him, still smiling, and say, Me. Sir, you are correct. I can't physically make you do anything. However, I'm also not going to be moving from this spot. So if you want to take a seat on the tiers, you are going to have to physically move me. He obviously wasn't feeling that option and finally got the hint that I wasn't going to be bowing down to his complete jack buttery, so he mumbled something about seeing a friend and scuttled off. I know what you're thinking. That's not really petty revenge, though, is it? I agree. What I did next, though, is the epitome of petty revenge, in my opinion. So the event starts and is all going really well. A couple of hours later, I'm in our office grabbing a drink before heading off to check on lunch prep when the client walks in with one of my colleagues. The client is a lovely lady, very sweet, down to earth, and grateful whenever we work with her, so I'm a big fan. She's also a pretty big deal in the host company, very senior. I get a great idea. I wander up to the client and my colleague and say to my colleague, me, I'm really sorry to bother you, but I had a quick question. H, of course, what is it? Me, I just wanted to check that there wasn't any assigned seating in the main plenary sessions. I didn't think there was, but I had one of the dealers come up to me and insist that he didn't want to sit with his customers. H, no, apart from the press and speakers, the rest was communal seating. C, wait, he said he didn't want to sit with his customers? Me. Yes, he said it was ridiculous that we expected him to sit with them and that he wanted special access to the tiered seating before it was opened. I told him he couldn't do that, and he eventually took a seat elsewhere. C. Right, and I don't suppose you got his name, did you? Me. Actually, he showed me his badge. I think he was called John Johnson? C. Okay, thank you for letting me know. I'll deal with this. I smiled, thanked her, and walked away to carry on with the rest of my work. I don't think I'll ever know what happened to John Johnson, but I hope it made him sad. And our last story. HOA has destroyed my pond and I want revenge. So I was away for the holidays and I came back on Monday to find my project car was towed out of my driveway. My pond was emptied out and filled with gravel and sand and fenced off two acres, two chains by one furlong of my property closest to HOA. I immediately called the police and filed a report regarding the stolen property. The car wasn't registered and was just an empty shell, so I have no idea where it is, nor will it be easy to track. It's not worth a lot, maybe $2,500, but it's the principle of my jack wagon president of the HOA. I've had a lot of problems with him before, and I think it's because he doesn't like black people very much. I mean, I know it for a fact, I just don't want to tell you more about it. 
I had my lawyer draft up the C&D and sent it nearly two weeks ago and they haven't contacted me in any way except this. I hired a local salvage company to come tear up the fence this weekend and they're doing it for free of charge since I'm letting them keep the fence to sell as scrap metal or whatever they do with it. My lawyer suggested I send up a letter demanding payment to fix my pond as it was filled in with gravel and sand. A local landscape company quoted me nearly $8,000 to get the pond back the way it was. So that's what he suggested I ask, and another $2,000 for loss of use of the pond. Update. The hearing ended in my favor, guys. I got money for my damaged pond and even more than what my lawyer advised. Suck it, HOA. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.